Yes, I am. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Richardson Chamber of Commerce Women in Leadership Virtual Quarterly Luncheon. My name is Cassie Lawson, and I am the founder and CEO of Lawson Event Rentals here in Richardson. And I am joined by the wonderful Susan Casson of Ebby Holiday. And together we are your co-chairs for today's luncheon. We are both members of Women in Leadership Committee and the purpose of WIL is to inspire, influence, and champion powerful women through advocacy, mentoring, and networking. And also um, at the end of the program today, we'll tell you how you can get more involved in WIL and the different committees that we have to support your growth and leadership in this community. We are excited that so many of you are able to attend and embrace this new virtual norm that we're becoming accustomed to. And today we have a wonderful duo joining us as our guest speakers. We have Tawan Brown and David Alexander, and they will be allowing us to observe and learn from their courageous conversation about race. Uh, their presentation will be in a dialogue format uh, between the two of them. And then we know and we hope there will be many questions from you, our audience, throughout the course of their conversation. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to ask you to please put your questions in the chat at the bottom throughout their conversation. And then Susan is going to be tracking those questions along the way. And she'll choose some of those to ask at the end during our short Q&A time. Um, during this session, if you're going to be moving around, please go ahead and turn off your video. However, I will say that if you're able to sit through, we would love for you to leave your video on because it's always nice to see smiling, attentive faces when you're speaking. Um, and just as a reminder, please um, mute your microphones throughout the session. So next, I want to introduce our committee's leadership team, as we like to do at every luncheon. And this year, um, our lead tri-chair is Amy Spahn. She's the director of the Warren Center. And then our tri-chair, Jeannie Jones of Wimmer Solutions and Erin Williams of Edward Jones. Thank you, ladies, for all you have done for us this year. Um, and we could not have this outstanding WIL program without our equally outstanding partners and sponsors. Our title sponsor is Methodist Richardson Medical Center, uh, represented today by President Ken Hutchenreiter. Ken, are you on? I believe you have a, maybe a few words you want to share with us. If not, I think Jan is here. Jan, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> you sure are. That's okay. Um, I, um, Ken must have got pulled into something. That's that's how it is when you're a busy hospital president. Um, but I would like to welcome all of you here today. What a great day uh, to, to be inside, right? And what a great topic. I'm really looking forward to this. I know Tawan personally, and I know this is going to be a fabulous presentation. And we're just glad you could all be here today. And David, I look forward to your role in this as well. Um, and uh, we're just glad you're here and we're happy to sponsor Women in Leadership. Thank you, Jan. And we're very thankful for Methodist Richardson. Um, and we are pleased to have an associate sponsor of the WIL program today, Texas Bank and Trust. Texas Bank and Trust has a strong commitment to service excellence. The bankers who have served customers' financial needs for many years continue to provide the same efficient, personalized service you have come to expect. The bankers are the people you know, the bankers you trust. Now more than ever, Texas Bank and Trust. So please join me in thanking our major sponsors. You can give a little air clap. <laughs> Um, we also would like to thank our virtual table sponsors for today. That's Geico and RealPage. 
Thank you for sponsoring our event today. Even in this strange time of virtual luncheons, you guys were, were deeply grateful for your support and um, of our programs and for WIL. Um, I would also like to recognize the Richardson Chamber of Commerce Chairman of the Board, Stan Bradshaw. I saw him on here. He's with us today. Stan, we appreciate your support of WIL and thank you for attending today. Thank you, Stan. Thank you. One other quick announcement before we introduce our program. The WIL committee wants your feedback to better plan for the luncheons and other activities in the future. So we will have a link to a survey and it's gonna be in our chat and you can just click on that link and it will take you directly to the survey. Um, it's only a few questions and you should, it should take you just less than a minute to complete, but by taking the survey, you will automatically be entered in a drawing for a $25 gift card. So click on that link, it's really easy. And Andrea is gonna have that in our chat. Um, and she also, I think is gonna email it afterwards in case it goes away in the chat. Oh, there it is, she popped it up right there. Um, and now I want to introduce today's guest. So Tawan Brown is Vice President of Inclusion and Community Relations for RealPage, a leading global provider of software and data analytics to the real, to the real estate industry. In this role, she oversees and manages RealPage's inclusion and diversity strategy and is responsible for the development and execution of global community involvement initiatives that help make a sustainable impact in locations where RealPage has a presence. Prior to this, she was Senior Director of Organizational Development and Learning at RealPage, where she partnered with leaders at all levels to deliver business results by maximizing the ability of talent in the organization. Tawan is passionate about helping others, and that is evident. You will see that today. She currently serves on the Richardson Chamber Advisory Board and is the proud graduate of Leadership Richardson. She's a member of the STEAM Advisory Council of Fellowship Collegiate Academy and a lifetime member of the National Society of Black Engineers and co-leads the Couples Ministry at Concord Church. She's a proud wife and mother of two and she enjoys spending time with her family, traveling and serving others. And we also have David Alexander. With over 30 years of executive recruitment and talent management experience, David is passionate about helping organizations find people who will thrive in their unique business and operating culture. Prior to joining the Human Capital Group, he served as a senior human resources executive for many world-class firms. And most re recently, David served as the chief people officer for Raising Kings who under his tenure grew from 10,000 to 20,000 global employees. After working in public and private companies across multiple industries, David's under, David understands the challenges that both high growth and turnaround environments pose for organizations. That experience drives David's mission to find, strengthen, and grow transformational leaders for clients, both as an executive search consultant and executive coach. David is a graduate of Texas A&M University and has served as an officer in the United States Air Force. He and his wife, Marie, presently live in Flower Mound, Texas and are blessed with two children and one grandchild. When not supporting clients and spending time with his family, David enjoys hunting and fishing and serving his local church as a worship musician. Tawana and David, I wanna turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Cassie, and welcome all of you. It's so good to see all of you here today. Oh my goodness, we have a full crowd. I must admit, I am a little nervous about today's session for multiple reasons. Um, first, to the Women in Leadership team, I actually serve on that committee within the Richardson Chamber. And I gotta admit, I think I was volunteered for this assignment during that committee meeting, but I stepped up and accepted the challenge. So Stan, I think I should get some bonus points for that because you're out there. So check that box for me. 
Um, Real Paige, thank you for stepping up and being out in the audience. But another reason I'm nervous is because guess what I did? I invited my husband to join the session today. I'm going to talk about him a little bit during this presentation, and I think he's here. And so when I get home, I'm going to ask him how I did. So I'm nervous about that too. But I'm going to go ahead and hop into the presentation today. And Andrea, if you could go ahead and advance this um, slide for me. I want to just start off by just telling you how we got to where we are today and how David and I ended up doing this session together, how we're partnering, partnering on this courageous conversation. So last year, um, so I worked for a company, RealPage, and then last year, Kurt Twining, our chief people officer at RealPage, we were going to be hosting the chief HR executives across the Metroplex for a session at RealPage, and we were going to be talking about unconscious bias. And he asked me to facilitate a brief conversation about unconscious bias. And I was like, okay, yes, this is going to be a great opportunity. It's going to be great exposure for me. I'm going to talk to CHROs. Who wouldn't want to do that? And I was like, okay, unconscious bias. Well, yes, I'll, I mean, that's a diversity and inclusion topic. Yeah, I should know all about that. <laughs> okay, I hadn't facilitated on that topic before, but I'll, I'll study, I'll learn, and I'll do it. And so I was thinking about how I wanted to address that session. And I was like, okay, and it's the... You know, as we neared the session date, I said, okay, hmm, and I'm just going to be real with y'all. I thought to myself, I wonder if there are going to be any other Blacks in the room, right? And I said, hmm, probably not a lot. And then I said, oh, everybody in the room is going to be at a higher level than I am. Hmm. And so I was just like, okay. So... I thought about, okay, I'm going to do this through storytelling. This is how I'm going to reel, it, reel them in. And so, Andrea, if you could advance the slide. What I did, the, the way I told the story is I actually was very transparent with the audience, and I told about my own experiences with unconscious bias. And I'm not going to go through the whole long story because we don't have a whole lot of time. But basically what I did is I told about the way I was raised as a child. And I told about the way my husband was raised as a child. And some of the messages and things I heard growing up versus some of the things my husband heard growing up and how we met and we got married and just basically just how those things intercepted when we got married. Fast forward a little bit. So what you see here is my husband is standing in the middle and the Newberries. The Newberries are my husband's adopted parents. So my husband has a blind side story. He has a blind side story before the blind side movie was famous. And yes, it literally is like the movie. Miss Newberry, who you see in the picture, was his high school guidance counselor. She basically um, adopted Tony in high school. He went to live with their family, very similar to the movie. You know, she made sure he studied for the ACT. He went to TCU on a full scholarship and very similar. And the Newberries are very much a part of our lives today. And through meeting the Newberries, I, I, there were some messages that I heard about white people growing up that didn't align with who the Newberries were when I met them in person. So guess what? I had to check my biases and interrupt them and relearn some things. So I told that story and was honest with the group and David was in the room and he heard it. And guess what? He followed up with me afterwards and we developed a relationship with that. We developed a friendship. 
and he invited me to a session and we have kept in touch since then and he checks in on me i check in on him and when this opportunity came up i said david i want you to do this session with me and he accepted and so this is how this came about and i'm just so excited that david is here with me to engage in this conversation okay andrew you can advance the slide so why i wanted to do this and engage in this conversation this is my why i think this is a great opportunity for education and awareness here on this slide you see black men in my life who are very near and dear and important to me I have a twin brother who is just like me. He's the male version of me. He's my personality. <laughs> he is a motivational speaker. He's an author. He's a minister. He works with students. Um, I want to tell you about something that happened to him earlier this year. Um, he was, he goes into student, I mean, he goes into and to schools and he works with students on um, various programs and so earlier this year he was sitting outside of one of the schools that he's been working with he's been working there for about three years now but he was having a pizza party he was going to be hosting a pizza party at one of his schools he had ordered pizza and he was sitting in the car waiting for domino's pizza and um while he was waiting on the pizza to arrive, um, the school officer showed up because they had received a call that there was a strange black man on the premises. And so they were investigating the call. And so you can imagine what it was like when I talked to my twin brother that day, I called and there was just anguish because of what had happened when you know just everything that went along with that episode and you know it, it ended up being okay but there was a lot that went along with that in the middle is daryl daryl adams works for me um in at real page on the inclusion and community relations team earlier this year um this was while COVID was fairly early on, um, pre-mass mandate, um, Daryl lives near the Galleria, and he, um, he was running near the Galleria, and basically he had an incident with a police officer, and he had a bandana around his neck, and he was stopped by the police um, because of the bandana around his neck. And this was before the masks were mandated. But at that time, you know, they were saying you could use the bandana to have the covering. And so there was a little confusion about, you know, the mask, why he was wearing a mask running around the neighborhood, even though that's his neighborhood. So that was a, a police incident he had in his neighborhood. And then LaDaniel is, is one of my best friend's sons um, that was stopped and he had an unfortunate incident with the police. And this happened in Greensboro, North Carolina. And basically it was similar to the Ahmaud Aubrey incident and it, it didn't end up bad, but basically he was jogging um, in his neighborhood, he had on a hoodie and he's, he's a runner. And basically in his own neighborhood, the, you know, the police were looking for a, a suspect and actually it was a Hispanic man they were looking for, but I guess LaDaniel looked like him or close enough to him. And so here he is an honor student, a swimmer, but he, life forever changed, 16 year old stopped and frisked by the police. And so these are all just black men near and dear to me, just everyday life, just incidents with the police. And so for me, it's personal and I do want us to have this conversation because 
it's more than just about George Floyd to me. And as horrific as that was, there are so many instances that just happen in everyday Black America. And I want to make sure that people are aware of it so we really can have these courageous conversations. Okay, Andrew, if you could advance the slide, please. So, when we talk about, um, while we're here today, talking about our differences is beneficial. And yes, even in the workplace. I think it's important for us to be aware of that because so many times we've been, I think we've been told don't talk about things like race. It's a political issue. Don't talk about justice in the workplace. But the reality is there's so many benefits to talking about our differences, things such as race, gender, or ethnicity in the workplace. Um, Catalyst, they're an organization, they're a nonprofit organization that um, helps advance women in leadership. They did some research and they found out that employees actually reported feeling included when they feel both valued for their uniqueness and a sense of belonging for being their authentic selves. And this is really what we talk about when we say inclusion. Inclusion is when everybody feels like they have an equal voice and they can learn from those who may be different than they are in some way. And it really helps spark innovation and teamwork. And those are all things that companies are looking for. Okay, Andrea, you can go on. Now, so what are some of the roadblocks, some of the things that stand in our way um, from having these types of dialogues are what we refer to as roadblocks. And it's the assumptions, the attitudes or experiences that um, hinder us. And I think underneath some of these things are really things such as fear or lack of knowledge or the perceived inability to make a difference. And some of the common roadblocks or some of the key things, they're things like, you know, there isn't a problem. And, you know, this could manifest in statements like, well, you know, I don't see color, only people. Or people don't necessarily see a benefit in even talking about it. You know, there's judgment about whether it's really worth the effort to discuss some of these issues. Or I think a lot of times people think that there could potentially be negative consequences to their actions. Like there's the fear of, well, what happens if I really say the wrong thing, or if I say something inappropriate, is somebody going to think I'm a racist, or is somebody going to think I'm a sexist? And so I think that's some of the challenges that we have, why people don't want to have the conversation. But now I'm going to talk about what are the ground rules to have a courageous conversation. And then David and I are actually going to engage in a courageous conversation. And if you could advance the slide. So the ground rules for a courageous conversation. I think first it's important, you have to go into this kind of conversation assuming positive intent and really embracing a mindset that this kind of talk is going to lead to something good and put aside your own biases and viewpoints to focus on what a person is actually saying and what they really mean. In this kind of conversation also, you want to engage in dialogue and not debate. And the thing about dialogue is open-ended and it's you expressing your experiences, your viewpoints, and also learning from someone else's. And sometimes it could be that you can just agree to disagree it doesn't have to be right versus wrong. I mean, you can walk away and just hear somebody else's, uh, just hear a different perspective. And I think that's very important, just getting another point of view. Also in a courageous conversation, you have to be willing to open mouth, insert foot. It's okay to make mistakes except the fact that you're not gonna always say the right thing. And guess what? If you make a mistake, 
say I'm sorry, <laughs> apologize, and ask questions. I'm sorry I offended you. What was it about what I said that hurt you? I mean, just ask for forgiveness. This next one, be quick to listen and slow to speak. I'm gonna say that one again, that's good. And guess what? Cassie said I do marriage ministry too. That works in, in relationships too. So somebody try that at home and you'll, you'll thank me for that later. Be quick to listen, slow to speak. So don't just hear what somebody is saying, but actually listen. So con consciously choosing to listen and hear what they're saying. And then the last one, Having a conversation about race, yes, it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable, but you've heard that saying, we have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Well, I'm uncomfortable having this conversation right now, but I'm taking the risk that, I mean, something good is going to come from this. So um, you have to accept that it's a risk that's worth taking. So these are some of the ground rules that are necessary to engage in a courageous conversation. Okay, so now let the courageous conversation begin. So David, I want to thank you so much for being willing to hop on this call with me today. And first of all, David, I just want to say when I first reached out to you and I asked you to do this, would you engage in this conversation? You immediately said, yes, you would do it. And I want to know why and what are you hoping to gain from our discussion today? Well, thank. And by the way, thank you everybody for uh, being here today. It's uh, it's an honor to be here, and thank you, to, uh, Tawan, for uh, inviting me. You know, to answer your question, first of all, you're my friend, right? So you asked me to do something, and I did it because you're my friend. So that's number one. Um, but but number two, I think for everybody on here, you know, I've been on a personal journey um, before before the George Floyd incident, and uh, and I'll share. Uh, it is a faith walk for me. I know there's probably people of different beliefs on here, and. Uh, but I just wanted you to know where I'm coming from. And I had this, I had this uh, awakening about two, three years ago that I couldn't be a follower of Christ and hate my brother or dislike my brother. And my brother could be black. My, bro my brother could be fat. They could be ignorant, whatever. I realized that I couldn't share that in my heart at the same time. So I was, I was, I was struggling with this. And, and it was interesting. I never really grew up in a in a, in a racist kind of environment that people might think it was a very, it was a separate environment, very protected environment. Um, but I wasn't exposed to a lot of it, but I realized, um, and, and by the way, I was an HR executive for 30 years. So I was driving this in companies. I taught it. I mean, I, 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 I lived it out in work, but I realized there was garbage in my heart. Um, and so when I, when I heard Taiwan speak that day, it was changing because I realized I had biases. So, you know, that's why I'm here. And, and the, other, the other last thing I'll say is that, you know, everything that we're seeing going on in the world right now, um, it's, it, it's uh, people talk about it being political, but it's a hard issue. And uh, for me, it was, um, it's not a democratic issue. It's not a Republican issue. It's not CNN. It's not Fox. And I realized I'm not going to let those people speak for me. I'm going to, I'm going to do, I, you know, and I had a choice. Do I sit on the sidelines or do I, do I go out and be part of the battle, right? And so that's why I'm here, you know, because, and by the way, this is probably about the fourth one I've done. First one I've done with Tawan, but it's about the fourth one I've done. So I've gotten better at being uncomfortable, but it's still very uncomfortable for me. But, um, and you know, what do I hope to accomplish? I don't hope to accomplish anything. What I hope is that everybody here walks away thinking about this and is willing to, to, to Tawan's point, to put themselves in an uncomfortable situation. And I think if you think about anything in life, um, uh, exercise, you know, when you get out and first start exercising, it's uncomfortable. It's no fun, right? But the, the more you do it, the easier it becomes. Um, and, I, and I also want to point out, this, this doesn't just apply to race. This applies to relationships in general and everybody we deal with. I think, you know, we're talking to the chamber here. You know, if you're in business, if you're a better listener and you're willing to understand where people are coming from, you're going to make better deals. You're going to run a better business. You're going to treat your customers better. So that's a side benefit of all this. I mean, we're talking about race here specifically, but I just want to say that this, this listening piece is huge. So 
if people walked away from here questioning themselves and, and willing to look, and I'm not talking about feeling guilty. I'm talking about saying, wow, I, I have some stuff there that I probably got to deal with and how do I deal with it? So that's the answer to the question. And I, I guess I'm real cre really cre or curious for you, Tawan, you and I have an app, we haven't even talked about this. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm gonna kind of put this on you here in real time. So, you know, you look at the last six months, it has been really, really challenging in so many ways, COVID, everything else going on. I just want to know how you're feeling, you know, kind of uh, post George Floyd and everything that's happened. Uh, I, and I apologize, I haven't asked you that before. How are you feeling these days? It's a lot, David. It's, oh gosh, it's, I think it was last week I was, um, David and I were communicating last week, and I, I don't know, David, I, I don't even know what word I used. I was writing David, and I was like, I don't know if I said sad, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know. I said something to David in an email. I was, I was here. You said you were heartbreaking. I, yeah, I was here late at night. One, I'm at work, y'all. So I was here late at night one day last week, and I remember I was in the office, and you know, I was like, just go take a news break, right? Let me go look and see what's going on. And I remember I went and I just did a quick check to see what was going on, right? And I looked at the news and y'all, I just, tears literally started rolling down my eyes, like unexpectedly. Now my husband's on here and he probably would say like, okay, what else is new? Cause I, you know, you might see tears from me at any point. But I think it was just, the way of of everything going on because it's just it's just so much going on right now and it's just like I, I think I would compare it to just the stages of grief it's like you're cycling through all of these different emotions it's like you're you're sad you're angry and you're frustrated um there's a sense of um, trauma because like, for example, I, I told you about those, um, you know, the, the men in my, I told you the stories of the men in my life, that's this year. But then it's like these stories, they're triggering old things, you know, cause it, you know, you see the George Floyd and then I'm thinking about the call I got when, you know, they thought my dad had robbed the bank 15 years ago. Like, it's all of these things going on. And on top of that, there's COVID. And there's like, oh my goodness, my kids are starting school next week. And we made the decision to let them go in person. And then you're like, ooh, was that the right decision? But they really need in person because that'll do better for them in learning. And so, you know, there's that going on. And then there's you know, like, oh, I'm, a, I'm an employee and I'm leading diversity and inclusion right now. And that's, it's a lot going on with that. So I got to perform. I got to, I got to execute, <laughs> you know, there's all of that going on. And then I know a lot of people are, you know, there's fear, right? There's the fear of personal safety. There's that piece going on. So there's that. And then there's loss of icons right you you know the black superhero died you know and it's like i didn't even know he was sick you know and it's like john lewis passed away so i think there's all of that going on and i'm not gonna leave y'all with doom and gloom because anybody who knows me you're gonna know that i'm hopeful too so in the midst of all of that there's still this sense of oh my goodness, do you see what's happening? <laughs> like people are marching all across, not just the US, people are marching all across the globe saying racism is bad. Like there is an awakening that's going on, like things that we have been seeing in the black community and saying over and over, hey, do you see what's happening? Like people are opening their eyes and they're, they're seeing what's happening and there are people that are coming alongside and reaching out and saying how can we how can we be involved how can we help what can we do corporations are making statements and while we know that statements are enough we still have more statements than we've had before 
corporations are supporting causes and they're making some initial investments. And while that's not, you know, there's more to be done, it is a start. We're having conversations like this that I don't know that we've had before. So I'm optimistic that, you know, we're, we're starting some much needed dialogue that has needed to happen and that we're going to see fruit that comes out of some of these things that are starting to take place. So that's where I am, David. <laughs> Look, that was a lot. But David, with all of that said, there are a lot of people who are feeling like they're dealing with all of that that I just said. So with you, I mean, you're a former CHRO, and I know a lot of people, there are a lot of leaders on this phone, there are a lot of people who are colleagues to the blacks in the workplace or friends and they have not touched this subject they didn't know what to say they didn't know how to say it and so what advice would you have for them um like about how to how to address this subject what what, what do they need to do right now sure sure well you know it's interesting so you know um I was in, I started in HR actually when it was personnel, so they didn't even call it HR at the time. And they didn't even have the word diversity and inclusion. It was generally affirmative action and those kinds of things. So I've watched it over the years, but um, I think that, I think the first thing is, is that um, in, in, if you're a small business, it's a little bit harder, but, but, but get someone who knows something about it before you jump into it. I think you can make some really big mistakes, but with really good intentions. Um, so um, seek some advice. I think if you're going to get your, your house remodeled, if you're going to get your car repaired, um, you know, you do need to talk to somebody. So there's a lot of people out there. And I know you, uh, I would, I would welcome anybody to reach out to me after this call. I think you're going to, uh, our contact information is out there. Um, and we kind of direct you so people can help you. So I think that's number one, but I think, um, it starts with have a position, you know, really what, do you, what, what, why is it important to you? And I think as a leader, if you're leading the organization, you need, you need to understand why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and and I, I think we're, and I'll, I'll be transparent, I get irritated when I see companies just coming out and saying something, but you don't see the real action and the meat behind it. And I've watched it for years. You can go to a lot of websites and guys, I'm being raw here. So if I offend somebody, uh, uh, forgive me, but you know, I see uh, the website that has uh, 2.5 black people on it. It has a as everybody represented and all the statements in the building, but you really don't see it happening or reflected in the way the, co the company operates. So um, I think it's, first of all, you need to have a position. You need to be clear with everybody in the company on what your position is on it. And it's not political. Um, at the end of the day, it comes down to treating people with respect. That's what this is all about is we respect the differences here. We're still have, we're going to run our business. We're going to, we're going to do it well but we're going to respect people and we respect our customers. We're going to respect our suppliers and we're going to respect the people that work for us, our team members, the most important folks. And that's the environment we're going to have. It's an environment of respect. As a result of that environment of respect, all the other stuff comes out <laughs> in terms of, uh, you know, driving diversity and those things. So I think number one, you have to have a position. You have to create a standard of what appropriate behavior looks like in the company. Um, and then the other thing is, which is so, so important, you have to create a safe environment. You know, it's so tough sometimes if, if you allow somebody to say something, even if it might be controversial, if you, if you, if you uh, punish that person, everyone else is going to be very hesitant to speak up. So I think it's, it's been a creating uh, an environment for people to be able to, 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 to share their thoughts on things um, and do it in a constructive way. Um, and I think that that also means you do need some people inside who can help facilitate and teach that. Um, and that may be you as the leader of your business, if it's a smaller business. But, and I think that takes me to the last piece is that as a leader in your business, the most important more than any policy, any poster, any, any class that you have is you're modeling the behavior, which is that, that, that not only are you creating that safe environment with your conversations, but you're encouraging them and you're modeling the behavior. So, so often, uh, you know, what you see in companies is people will um, put these statements out there, but they don't model the behavior. So I think that's, I think that's, you know, that's a very, very high level, but I think um, it starts, it starts 
Um, it starts small. This is a journey, by the way. So I don't think anybody that, you know, if we, if we looked at, you know, slavery in America, how many years it goes back, it's taken a long time to get to where we are. This is not going to change overnight, but it does start with a plan and, and going at it thoughtfully um, and uh, courageously. So I'll stop there. So I, I'm, I'm curious for you, um, uh, Taiwan, um, you know, a lot of companies have rejected racism as a serious problem. Um, and um, do, I mean, do you think that, uh, I mean, I guess I'm just trying to think of this. Do you think that um, it's heading in the right direction or do you think we're getting worse? Do you think we're going backwards? I think that we have made some significant progress in some areas, but I think in other areas, we have a long way to go. So like when you look at statistics, you'll see that, you know, you, as far as blacks being educated, you know, blacks graduating from high school, blacks going to college and graduating, you know, those numbers are a lot higher than they used to be. If you, if you look at black progress, as far as um, government and Congress and Obama, you know, we had our first black president. I mean, you're gonna see a lot of improvement there. Um, you know, honestly, black culture, you know, if you look at black in certain industries, um, you know, athletics, I mean, you know, certain industries, blacks are doing very well. But then I think if you look at black incarceration rates, um, you know, the incarceration rate for blacks is six times greater than that of whites. If you look at wealth i was i was looking at some statistics the other week and i was telling my husband i was like baby did you know that the median wealth for blacks is seventeen thousand, and for whites it's one hundred and seventy one thousand. i mean that's a big gap you know if you look at unemployment rates it's, it's double you know it's for blacks it's six percent for whites it's three percent you know if you're you know, the poverty rate, rate for Blacks is double for Blacks as it is for whites, you know. So there are still some significant things, you know, some significant opportunities. And honestly, corporate America, let's talk about my world. I mean, we have a lot of companies that are represented here and the challenges are consistent. If I say, hey, if we look at Blacks and senior levels of leadership, I mean, you know, the, the numbers are consistent. It doesn't really matter what, what company. If I talk about Blacks on at the board level, I mean, we still have significant progress to make in, in some areas. So while we've made progress, we still got, we still have long ways to go, if, if that makes sense. No, it does, it does. Uh, Cassie, I just want to make sure we have a few times for questions. I know that this has been a very, uh, it's been trying to get a lot of information in a, a short period here. Do we want to open for questions or do we have time for one more question between uh, Tawana and I? I think uh, I'll let Susan answer that because she's yeah. keeping track of the questions, but I think we have time for a few more minutes of discussion before we go into the Q&A. Perfect. Yeah, we, we've had two questions so far and, um, and I'll, so I'll let y'all talk a little bit. We have a really good question. One of them was kind of answered, I think, as you were speaking. But if you have a couple more minutes, let's let's wrap that up, and then we'll go to questions. Sounds okay, good. Okay, because David, I do want to ask you this. I do want to ask you this question, even though I might get myself in hot water. Okay, but David, we're talking about race, and and I'm gonna mention a word. It's the P word, and I don't know if I should do it or not. But when we talk about race, one of the areas that people sometimes get a little uncomfortable with um, is this whole concept of privilege and particularly when you use the word white privilege. So I would like for you to elaborate a little bit on what is privilege or white privilege. What exactly is that and how does that manifest in or 
out of the workplace. Let's talk about it. Yeah, boy, this is a tough one. Um, and I have to admit, uh, just being transparent, when, when I first started to hear the term, I got angry. Um, you know, I think about just you know, how my father grew up. He lost his, he lost his, uh, his father at the age of seven. His mother was unable to feed their family. There were six kids and they lived in Bayonne, New Jersey. And, uh, you know, my dad got up at five in the morning, went to the bakery and worked and, and then, uh, went to school then came home and delivered paper studies. And that was his life, you know, and he and his, his sister stopped going to high school to, 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 to support the family, didn't get her degree, you know? And so, you know, I grew up with these, that humble roots. And so when I, when I was, I was literally disgusted when I heard somebody say, wow, you have this white privilege, right? And I thought about what privilege is that, right? Um, but, um, but then I, but then I realized, um, I started to think about it is, is, you know, um, was I able to get, I may have had to, I may have had to work for things, you know, my, my father may have had to work for things, but was I afforded certain things that I didn't even know about, right? Um, and, and so that was the first realization. And it was, it was interesting. I watched, I love the show Bull. It's kind of, it's kind of fakey, but they showed these, uh, this guy getting into college the other day and his parents had, had bribed the admissions counselor. He never even knew it happened. He went there, he worked hard on school and everything. And so when I start to think about that term, why privileges is, 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 is that, uh, and even, even starting with things like education, right? You know, Tawan, you were talking about um, uh, poverty and, and education and income rates and those things that takes generations and generations. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate. You know, there are people that lift themselves out of you know, their bootstraps and things like that. Um, but, but what I realize is that, um, that I was, I was probably afforded some things, right. That I didn't even realize, right. I was, I was like, and you know, I may have been a part of an interview process, right. That, that, the person doing it may have had a racist bias, right? I made it past somebody else. I remember now, I remember when I was, a, I first got out of the Air Force, I worked for a, a re big retail company here in, in uh, Texas. And I remember it was two guys, my, the, other, the other guy in my training class, he was a black guy, both in the Air Force. We became friends, as, you know, Harvey, I won't say his last name, but um, he didn't make it through the program. Um, and he and I were working hard every single day. And I don't, and I, to this day, I still don't know what happened, why he didn't make it through the program. Um, and so I, I always wondered to myself, okay, was there, was there race involved? So I think to, to, to kind of button it up a bit is, is I just think what it comes down to is I think because of years and years, I think, I think many of us have been accustomed to things that we just, and it, by the way, it's our reference point. This is my reality, right? So when I hear somebody say, wow, you had that, um, I've never been pulled over. I've never been pulled over. Uh, if, if I was pulled over, it was because I was speeding. I just got a speed ticket in Williamson County, by the way. Um, but, um, it's because I was breaking the law. Um, and so, uh, so I, I think my, my, re I think my, I respond much differently to it right now. Um, when people, when, when people, when you really try to understand is, Hey, I came from a, a perspective. I had, I had an educated family. I had all these things around me that helped me be successful. I had the support system. Um, and I didn't, and I don't think I had anybody working against me. So, um, it's still something I'm working on. I got to tell you. I, I still get bothered by it, but I'm better understanding it because I'm trying to understand people from their from their perspective. I don't know if that helps. It it does, and I think for me, as I've had conversations with people, one of the things I try to explain is is that it doesn't mean for me when I think about white privilege, it doesn't mean. You haven't had to work hard or, you know, you, you didn't have to overcome difficult circumstances. I think about it as there may be some things you may not have had to overcome. There may be some obstacles that you didn't have to face because of your race. For example, being followed around the grocery store because somebody thought you were going to shoplift. You may have never had that experience. Whereas if I ask a lot of black people, like, have you ever just gone to the grocery store and been followed around the store? Probably several people would say yes. Or have you ever been shopping 
and somebody asks you for help because they thought you worked there. I mean, I think a lot of people may have, you know, that sort of experience. I mean, they're, they're just different um, things. Or I think they're also conversations, of, for example, conversations about race. And David, I think you and I had this conversation. In a lot of Black families, conversations about race, they are not new. Conversations about race start very early. And even conversations about how you interact with the police and community helpers, um, you, you have those conversations early. Um, you know, one of my white friends called me and during this time, and she said, Tawan, you did not tell me about the talk. And I was like, what are you talking about? She was like, I didn't know that black parents had to have a talk with their kids about the police. And I said, well, yes, we do. And I, and you know, we had to have it with Jaden. Jaden is my 12 year old. And for some of you, you may not know this, but a lot of black parents, we have conversations with our children that you may not have with your children about how to interface with the police. And after the George Floyd situation, I, we talked with Jaden, my 12 year old, this is how you interact with the police. If you ever interact with the police, you put your hands on the steering wheel and you, you show them where you put your hands. Like, and this is a conversation that any black parent will have. You let them see your hands because you don't want them to think that you're reaching for something. Like this is something that's normal that you have. And if I had, if we had black boys, we would have already had this conversation a lot earlier. And it's not that you're teaching them that are black boys, but it's, I mean, that police officers are bad, but it's, you're just teaching them. You want them to make sure that, you know, people are feeling safe with them. And so these are the types of things. It's, it's a privilege and a luxury that you may not have to do that. And we do. And so those are just the, the types of things we mean by privilege. And, you know, I know it's 1250. Yeah. I, so. I, I, it's like, I feel like um, we just got started. <laughs> Um, I hate to cut cut you guys off and cut this short, but now we're getting a lot of questions in. And so I'm going to go ahead and try to, um, and they all kind of came in at once. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to try to consolidate them. But the, the first question is just, and this is kind of a big one. It's from our um, CEO, Bill Spruill, asked, you know, Taiwan and David, can you give us some recommendations on ways to just break down these racial stereotypes? I know that's a big a big ask, but it's a lot, lot to wrap up in a couple minutes, but. I, I think, I mean, I think uh, it's starting with a plan. Um, don't just jump into the deep end of the pool. I mean, I think, I think jump into it in, in a way that, you know, hey, I'm going to go do it, you know, with a, with a, with a ambition to go do it. But I do, th I think start with a plan. I'm thoughtful about what you're solving for. Um, and, um, cause I think sometimes it's like, uh, you know, I, I, I use car analogies. You can go just start working on your car and you can mess it up pretty bad if you don't have a plan and you don't know what you're doing. So I think it starts with a, a, a plan. And I think if you don't have somebody on your team who's capable of helping you pull that together, then find somebody you can. Um, and I think there's a ton of people here. I can, I can certainly give you recommendations for people, um, that can help you walk, do on the uh, walk on this. And, and those folks are, are very, very busy these days because I think a lot of co companies and a lot of CEOs are asking the same questions. But I think, I think it starts with a plan. You know, what do you, when you, when you talk about that general topic of breaking down racial biases, I think it starts with, you know, um, a plan of how are you going to train and how are you going to talk with folks? I mean, you got to remember, you've got a system made up of, of, let's just say your company has a hundred people, right? You've got a hundred uniquely made people there. And so to go in with a carpet bombing approach, we're going to get everybody you know, we're going to get everybody's biases straight. It's work. And I think that's the other one I would say up front is you need to have a plan. You need to have, you need to have some professional help, but, um, but it also, it's work. It, it doesn't happen. Okay. We've checked the box. We've sent everybody to class. It takes work. 
it takes persistence over time. So I'm not sure that's the best one. I'm, and by the way, I'm happy to take time off uh, here and talk more about it with anybody who wants to, free of charge. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, this is a little bit more specific. Um, can you talk about the stress of code switching in the workplace to make others feel comfortable with your race? <sighs> Look, as I saw, <laughs> um, it's, it's very, it's so code switching in case, um, in case you all may not know what that is, code switching is actually um, inter going back and forth between languages um that's what it really means and so it might be like there's a certain way that i may talk to um friends versus how i have to talk to my executive team like to somebody i'm very familiar with hey girl but then when i go up into the c-suite i have to present Okay, so, and so it's just like, so going in between two different languages. And so um, there, there, is a, there is a stress of going in between those two dynamics because you have to, depending upon it, the audience that you're presenting to, you may have to do it a lot of times, you know, in any given day. And there, there could be so many different groups that you're interchanging with. And so there is a lot. And I think some people, it just depends on who you are. Because for me, like my personality, I am who I am. And people are a lot more accepting of my style, like regardless, because it's like, ha, ah, like, I mean, so regard for me, it's, it's a little easier because people are more accepting of my style. But for example, for an African American woman who is a little more dominant and people don't feel comfortable with her, she can be perceived as very aggressive. So she has to work that much harder to make people feel comfortable. Like she's too direct, she's overly aggressive. And so she has to tone it down a lot to make people feel com comfortable and receive what she's saying. And so it's just that much more work for her to make people be able to hear her. So a lot much, a lot more work for that style. Okay, thanks. All right, so we have a bunch of questions now. Andrea, I'm gonna, it's one o'clock. I know we're supposed to end at one. And so, um, I mean, I, do you want to keep going or I, I was going to say there's one question that I think came in about books or anything that you recommend. I'll, I'll ask that last question and then we can decide how to handle the rest of the questions because um, there's a bunch that came in at the end here. But um, do you guys have any other kinds of books or anything that would help, you know, specific material that we could take away um, to help educate ourselves on um, how to start these conversations. We will include some resources. We will share some resources. Okay. Andrea, do you think we should go ahead and just move forward with the end? Or I mean, we've just got a bunch of questions here. I, yeah, I'm, so happy, I'm happy to stay on. I think if, I mean, I, my, my feelings won't be heard if people have to go, I understand. But if anybody else wants to stay on, I'm happy to stay a little bit longer here. Why don't we do the raffle and then um, people that need to leave can leave. And if anyone wants to stay on and ask more questions, we can do it then. How does that okay. sound? Yeah, that sounds, sounds good. I'll go ahead and kind of wrap it up. If anybody wants to stay on, you're welcome. Um, but we do need to go ahead and we have some, some gifts to give away. So um, if uh, I just, first of all, I want to thank you guys both for for being here today. Um, like I said, I feel like we just scratched the surface. We could sit, I can sit here all day and talk to you <laughs> and listen and learn. So um, we really appreciate all of your help and, um, and for being here with us today. Um, I have to make a couple of announcements just, um, just so you know, we, we also have another program, our Women in Leadership Committee has another program called Women for Women. And um, it's kind of a, uh, support group and networking group and um, and we've been meeting by Zoom, of course, um, 
and we're, we're trying to do things bi-monthly. So go ahead and go out to our chamber website and look at the events section. Um, we've had a lot of really good uh, meetings at night and they usually are around five o'clock. So um, they're usually about 30 minutes to an hour. Um, so please go to the chamber website, www.richardsonchamber.com for details about these Women for Women programs and also for our next upcoming luncheon that we'll have virtually again, that will be on December 2nd. So um, just stating again that our, our mission for women in leadership is to inspire, influence, and champion powerful women through advocacy, mentoring, and networking. And if you're not a member, we would certainly welcome you to become a member of our chamber and our Women in Leadership Committee. Um, you can contact Andrea, who's our host today from the chamber. Um, you can contact her. You can go to the chamber website. And um, there's several ways to, to get in contact, but we'd love to have you. Um, the more, the merrier. So who's ready for a door prize? And um, we have a virtual a uh, wheel of fortune here that Andrea is going to spin. We have four gifts, I believe, Andrea. Yes, four and gifts today. And, and I will go that, can I just thank the sponsors one more time? Thank you, Methodist Richardson, Texas Bank and Trust. Thank you so much. And also thank you, Geico and Real Page, for your table sponsorship. So we have four gifts today, and I'll go through each one here. The first is a $25 Amazon gift card donated by Amy Spawn of the Warren Center. Let's spin our wheel here. And our winner for that is Kevin Seward, real page. So I will reach out to you, Kevin, and get your contact information. And our second prize is an overnight stay at the Drury Plaza Hotel donated by Heather Van Voris with the Drury. Let's see who our winner is for that. And that will be Sue Ellen Price. Congratulations, Sue Ellen. Our third prize is a Google Home Mini donated by Sandy Trepto of Reliant. And our winner is Cassandra Rollins. Congratulations, Cassandra. And our last gift is a weatherproof phone and tablet recharger donated by Sandy Trepto of Reliant. Mm -hmm. And our winner is Nicole Erickson. So thank you to those of you that donated these gifts and we will reach out to the winners to get some contact information so we can get these mailed to you. Okay. So with that, I will just go ahead and say if you want to stay on, um, we do still have some other questions and our, our speakers have been gracious enough to say that they'll stay for a few more minutes. So um, otherwise, if we understand if you might have other plans, feel free to drop off. Um, and we hope to see you all at our next luncheon on December 2nd. So um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to another question. Um, this question comes from Vanessa Pacheo and it, it states, have policies either written or unwritten played a part with removing and or avoid, avoidance of talking about equity and race in the workplace? I, I, I don't think those uh, policies, this is just my opinion, I don't think the policies themselves um, remove them. I think they, I think one of the things I mentioned before is they create a standard for what acceptable behavior is. Um, I think where the rubber hits the road, and I, I'd love to hear Talon's opinion, but I think where it really makes a difference is how the company um, uh, reinforces those policies through their behaviors. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's where it happens. The other part is, is, you know, the, your, your hiring practices, the kind of people you bring into your company, right? Are, are you bringing in diverse folks? Um, I, I, I'm a, I'm just a firm believer because I've watched it for years. Diversity breeds diversity. 
And so the more people come in. So I, so I think the, I think your policies are good. You need to have those. And especially, I think if somebody steps over the line, but I think they're more about creating a standard, but it comes down to the, the, how you model that behavior in the company. That's where the real difference comes and where you don't tolerate stuff. Right. I think when you have a zero tolerance for those things, um, that's where it makes a big difference, but it's all about the modeling and the environment you create. So uh, Tawan, I'd, I'd be curious to hear what you want to say. I was going to, I agree with you, David. I was going to say, for example, performance management. And so you can have performance management and these rating and ranking, right? And so it's like a one to five scale, right? And so somebody gets a five and somebody gets a, a two, right? And when you go and, and HR is asking why this person got this versus why this person got that, and you're asking, you know, we have to do a better job at really, you know, working with the managers on, you know, eliminating bias in some of, you know, our processes, whether it be hiring, whether it be rating processes. I mean, those are the types of things that we have to work on. It's the behaviors. It's not necessarily the, the policy. Okay, thank you. Um, I did have another question, um, and this kind of is about about white privilege. Now I'm, I've lost it. I was kind of going through um, about this was uh, after recognizing your own privilege. What what can we do? Um, do you have any kind of tips for how to uh, how to um, address that once we realize Gosh, go ahead go ahead to one well i think um so if you do have privilege i think i think you know how can you use that privilege to help others like me i mean Look, there's not only white privilege. I'm an executive. I have access to people. <laughs> I have access to to rooms, um, resources that other people don't have. So, how do I use that access for good? To I forge, you know, relationships to to help others, to connect others, to you know, to provide resources to other people. And then, so I think it's like, how do you, to, you know, David, you know, David, trust me, David is connected. And knowing that David is connected, trust me, like, um, you know, I'm going to take advantage of that when I need to know certain people that he, he may know <laughs> that he can connect me to. David knows a lot of people in the diversity and inclusion world right now that I could need help. And so, David, can you do this? Like, I mean, he can, he can do that. So I think it's how do you take advantage of that privilege to connect people with the resources that they need? Yeah, I would agree. I think the other thing is, is it, um, it helps you make decisions through a different lens. So uh, I'll give you an example. So my, my kids definitely grew up privileged. You know, I did much better than my, my parents did. And I remember we went to a hotel in San Francisco. And I remember my daughter who had been to Hawaii two times already told me that the hotel was a dump because it didn't have robes in the, in the, uh, in the closet. And, um, and I thought to myself, wow, what have I done? And, uh, and so I share that story because I think you realize, wow, you know, I didn't even stay in a hotel till I was like 19 years old, you know, and this kid's been all over the world. So I use that as a lens is it, it if we make decisions through our own privileged view, uh, whatever that may be. And by the way, there's always somebody who has more than you, more privilege, and there's always somebody that has less, right? But I think if we take those things, you know, especially as a senior executive, um, I, I took my first job at AT&T and I, we had 30,000 people in the field that I was responsible for. And the decisions I made for people, 30,000 folks, I had to think, take it through the lens of, okay, not David, this, this, this upper middle class executive, it had to be through that associate in the store. How, so I think what it does is it just helps you make better decisions. 
if you don't use your filters, if you, if you use your filters to make decisions about things, a lot of times you can make some really tough and bad decisions. So I think that's the, been the most helpful for thing, thing for me is I make better decisions because I listen, I listen better and I try to take myself out of that process and try to understand who I'm making decisions for. I don't know if that makes sense to anybody, but that's, that's what I've done. I, I just think I'm, I'm a better listener now because um, I'm, I'm trying to remove the filters um, and biases that I have. And by the way, I am a work in progress. I still got stuff to deal with. So, you know, don't, don't let me come here and tell you that I've arrived because I certainly have not arrived. I, what other questions? I was going to, I read a TED talk the other day. Can I hear? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. And it was suggesting that we all, you know, prefer to work or do business with people that look and, you know, look like us. So he, they were recommending that, you know, to be intentional is to meet someone from a different race or a different uh, gender or, you know, whatever you might feel uncomfortable with to try and get to know that person, you know, have a lunch with them and just, has anyone seen Different Like Me? Um, it's a book or a movie about this rich family with a, a homeless person. So they got to know them and it just kind of changes your whole perspective once you get to know someone different than you. And so they, they just encouraged each other, uh, they encouraged us not to just hang out with the people that we always hang out with, to try to get out of your comfort zone every now and then. Because until you really get to know someone that's out of your sphere, you, you'll just never really get it. Like the two of you got to know each other and I think it's opened up, you know, uh, your, your understanding or empathy for each other. Did you read our bullet points, Angela? You must have got, got, got broke into the server and got our notes because that was one of our key points. So that's that's the oh, that's okay. one of that's one of the best <laughs> things you can do is uh, literally just spend people time with people that are different from you, and it's uncomfortable sometimes. It can be really uncomfortable, but it's amazing. Um, you know, uh, Tawan and my and myself could could not be any more different uh, in so many ways. But then. And through the course of building a relationship, we found out how much we have in common. So yeah, those, that's just the truth. So well said. Yeah, and I did want to, um, I want to just add something onto that because I, I think it makes the point. So, and David, I think I had shared this with you, but so I go to a church, um, Concord Church in, in South Dallas, and my pastor is friends with Jeff Warren. Um, pastors Park City's church so black mega church and white mega church two opposite sides of town and so a few years ago when Ferguson happened they um, got together and they said okay what if Ferguson happened in Dallas and so they began to meet and basically the men's group of my church and Park City's church began meeting together and having Bible study together. And so over the course of a few years, like a Bible study group has formed with um, our churches and the, the Bible study group has gotten tight over the years. Like, uh, the families, we've gotten to know each other. We've gone out to dinner, you know, once, but the men have really formed real relationships. And so after the George Floyd situation happened, one of the guys from Park Cities called my husband and he said, hey man, call a meeting. This is a weekend. We got to meet. We need to talk about this. And so that wouldn't have happened a few years ago, but after real relationship occurs, that happened. And they got together and they, you know, they had some dialogue, but this guy, one of the guys, he's, a, he's an executive for a big company here. And he's like, okay, I need to have, I need to bring this up, you know, at my office. And so, you know, he's meeting at this Bible study group and they're having dialogue about how he's going to bring this up at his, in his corporate boardroom because 
real relationship has formed because now it's moved from head to heart, right? And I think that's what really has to happen where this doesn't, it's not just check the box activity, but now true relationships have happened and now it's, it's empathy, but it's friendship and it's like I get it enough where I really understand you I know you there's friendship there's relationship and and now I'm uncomfortable not just because you're uncomfortable but now I'm willing enough to take a risk and I'm putting it on the boardroom table so we can really talk about it and I think that's where real change truly begins to take place. And I, and I apologize, guys, I do actually need to step away here. So um, uh, thank you so much for the privilege of being here. I know Tawan, you can keep going, but I just want to thank everybody for the opportunity today. And please, um, you know, I'm happy to, to uh, both of us are happy to continue the discussion um, offline with anybody um, uh, that, that's willing to listen. So um, thank you so much, guys. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you for thank doing you. it with me, David. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you, thank David. you David. I, I think um, I know we could go on all day to Juan and I just I want to thank you so much for everything that you've done here today. We've I mean, I, I would encourage everyone to read through the chats. We've gotten not not just questions, but we have a lot of great comments in there and I'm not going to read them all, but I would like everybody to read those. And then to Juan, if you could also um, send the resources that I know Audrey Prusky asked about getting some um, books to read and things like that. Maybe we could start a women in leadership book club or something. <laughs> um, there's just, uh, this was really, really great. I'm so, so pleased the, of the turnout and um, I hope you all have enjoyed it as well. So with that, I think we'll just go ahead and dismiss our, our session today. And um, thanks again. We appreciate everyone coming. Thank you. Great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Taiwan. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Taiwan. Bye. Bye-bye.